Movement is a fundamental part of our daily lives. Much of humanity's inventions revolve around moving objects from one place to another efficiently. It's no surprise that the question of how movement works is one of the oldest inquiries in science and philosophy. This topic has a rich history that not only teaches us about physics, but also shows us how human thought and knowledge have evolved over millennia. Today, we understand that objects have a tendency to maintain their state of motion. In other words, a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. You might recognize this concept as Newton's first law, or law of inertia. This property, where objects continue in their state of motion or rest, can be seen as a form of stubbornness. However, don't be deceived by its simplicity. Understanding how things move was a profoundly challenging process. It required a pursuit of knowledge in its study of nature, spanning from ancient Greek philosophy to the famous theory of relativity that is now ingrained in popular culture. But how did we come to understand movement as we do today? What led Newton to formulate his three laws of motion? Our ideas about motion have changed significantly throughout history. To find the earliest records of hypotheses about movement, we need to go back to the ancient Greece and the philosophy of Aristotle. Aristotle, one of the greatest thinkers of ancient Greece, viewed the world as divided into two parts, the celestial bodies above the moon, which were eternal and unchanging, and the terrestrial bodies below the moon, which were composed the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air. Each of these elements had a natural place in the world. Earth at the center, water above it, then air, and finally fire at the highest point. Furthermore, each element had a tendency to move towards its natural place. For instance, a stone falls to the ground, water flows to the sea, the flame of a candle rises to be above the air, and so on. You might think this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about in the video, but this was the first idea of natural movement according to Aristotle. However, Aristotle also proposed another type of movement, forced movement. The idea behind forced movement was quite simple. If you have a movement that isn't natural, then you need a force to generate and sustain it. In simpler terms, if there is speed, then there must be a force driving and maintaining that speed. It was as if an invisible object was pulling the moving objects. This idea, however, is incorrect and exemplifies the paradigm that dominated for a long time. People believed there was a direct relationship between force and movement, but don't be mistaken, this is an obvious at all. If you throw a stone upwards, which force are acting on it? One might think it's the force of gravity and the force with which you threw it. The correct answer is only the force of gravity. We've understood this for about 300 years. If by chance you got this wrong, don't feel bad because it's not trivial. Even Aristotle made this mistake. Aristotle's explanation for this type of movement was that as the stone moved through the air, it pushed the air in front of it, creating a vacuum behind it. This caused the air to circulate around the stone, generating a force that pushed it upward. Despite this, Aristotle's idea of movement didn't satisfy anyone. One serious problem with Aristotle's hypothesis was explaining why things eventually stopped moving. For instance, if you roll a ball on a grass, it will eventually stop. How could this be explained? This led to a new theory of movement, impetus. This idea of impetus was that once the stone was thrown, it would remember the force exerted on it by my hand. As it moved away, this impetus would gradually wear off, causing the stone to fall back down. It was as if the stone had some memory of force applied to it. This idea that pushed objects remember the force applied to them was intriguing. However, as physics began to be expressed more through numbers and equations rather than thought experiments, this this theory fell out of favor. Describing the theory of impact mathematically became a significant challenge, especially as the world was undergoing substantial transformations due to technological advancement and the advent of firearms. People needed a more precise and numerical theory of motion to calculate the trajectory of cannonballs, predict the outcomes of collisions, and solve more complex problems than just falling stones. It was in this context that the famous law of inertia emerged. You might have heard it stated as a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. This well-known law of inertia was first introduced by Descartes, not Isaac Newton. Descartes proposed that 
bodies possess a quantity called momentum, which he interpreted as the total quantity of motion of an object. Descartes almost got it right. He defined momentum as the product of an object's velocity and its volume. However, we know that it's the mass of the objects that matters, not its volume. The concept of momentum gained traction as various experiments with pendulums, springs, and collisions seem to support the idea. Eventually, Newton formalized this concept into one of the most fundamental and enduring principles in physics, the conservation of momentum. This principle remains crucial in physics today, stating that in a closed system, the total amount of momentum is always conserved. Two bodies can exchange momentum during a collision, but it cannot be created or destroyed without an external force. I know it might seem odd that I've spent more than half the video without mentioning Newton's three laws, but the reason is to highlight the importance of the concept of momentum in leading Newton to his law of motion. Now let's explore how Newton used the conservation of momentum to derive his three laws of motion. First, consider the simplest case. A body moving in a straight line without any forces acting on it. Since no external forces is acting on it, the physical quantity we call momentum remains constant, meaning the body's motion will remain unchanged forever. This is the essence of Newton's first law of motion, commonly known as the law of inertia. It states that if you have an object moving at a constant speed, it will continue to do so unless a force is applied to it. But what happens when a force acts on this object? We already know that momentum is conserved in the absence of forces, so the force must be associated with some change in momentum. Imagine you have a box and you want to increase its speed. To do this, you need to add momentum to it, which you achieve by pushing the box. Pushing the box to make it move faster means you've applied the force, and this force causes a change in the momentum, resulting in increased speed. But wait, if the speed changes, we have another significant physical quantity to consider, acceleration. This is Newton's second law, which states that force acting on a body is equal to the change in momentum. You might be more familiar with this law as F equals ma, which is force equals mass times acceleration. We can derive yet another law of motion using the principle of momentum conservation. Imagine you kick a stone. The kick applies a force to the stone causing it to fly away. This means the stone gains speed and momentum. However, because your foot came into contact with the stone, the stone also applies a force back on your foot, resulting in a painful reaction. What you felt was the momentum transferred from the stone to your foot. This is the Newton's third law, which states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. The force you apply to the stone is matched by the force the stone applied to your foot, but in the opposite direction. Before moving on, we must pause and appreciate Newton's three laws of motion, which have shaped and transformed society since their inception, are all derived from the same fundamental physical principle. For today's standards, this principle is incredibly simple. It's remarkable to consider that such a revolutionary impact on our understanding of the world came from one fundamental idea, the conservation of momentum. This way of thinking is so powerful that it underpins physics even today. Identifying physical quantities similar to momentum that are conserved is often the starting point for solving complex problems. Principles akin to the conservation of momentum are behind how I describe everything from the motion of planets and the movement of electric charges to quantum field theory and relativity. This is why Newton is regarded as one of humanity's greatest geniuses. It's also why, after all these years, we continue to teach and learn Newton's three laws. Thank you very much, and I see you next time.